We've been waiting for spring. How much time do you think you spend waiting for something? It's amazing to me how much time we actually spend waiting. You may have found yourself in a room like the one on the screens. That's kind of a neat picture, isn't it? I don't know, maybe the composition of the colors, but do we like waiting? How, how many of you uh, like to sit for hours waiting? I have some interesting statistics because we don't like to wait. And all of us have what we have, what we call now smartphones. And smartphones have apps that are designed to help us wait. In 2021, on the Android phone, how many of you have Androids? Raise your hand. We'll pray for you. <laughs> I had to. I had to do that. On the Android phone in 2021, there were 477,877 mobile games available. If you have Apple, the rest of you, 957,390 games are available to download on your phone. Do you know why? Because we don't like to wait. We want to fill ourselves with something. App Annie is a survey company. They did a survey in 2021. 82.98 billion mobile games were downloaded in 2021. Let me, let me get that number one more time. Just under 83 billion mobile games downloaded. Because we don't like to wait. So, because we don't like to wait, there's all kinds of ways to pass the time while we wait. Thus, the title of the lesson, While You Ways to Pass the Time While We Wait. As we conclude our series on 2 Peter, within the last several verses of 2 Peter, over and over and over, Peter encourages them to wait. He tells them to wait for the coming of the Lord. He tells them to wait for the new heavens and the new earth. And then finally, as we get into our section of Scripture, he says, while you wait, be diligent. And we look at this concept as you have your Bibles open up to uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. He says, therefore, beloved, since you are waiting, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Be diligent to be found by him while you're waiting. Waiting for what? Well, if you're like me, I'm waiting for him to come back. We talked last week about the coming of the Lord and the fact of the matter it is, and now we wait. But because we're people who don't like to wait, we want to fill our time with things to do while we wait. So we pick up our phone and play the latest version of Candy Crush. Or we pick up our phone and play Temple Run. Or we pick up our phone and play Subway Surfers. That was the number two downloaded game. Because we don't like to wait. I know, I can see who has Subway Surfers because you all kind of look down in embarrassment right now. We don't like to wait. But while we wait, we try to to fill all of our time with things. So Peter encourages them, while you wait, be diligent. Remember this word? And we talked about it a lot, the first lesson, because he uses this idea. In chapter 1, it says, make every effort. Make every effort to supplement your faith with these qualities. Make every effort to be found by him without spot or blemish. Make every effort to be diligent while you wait. So I'd like to suggest some things this morning that we can do while we wait. Next time you're waiting, let me suggest, instead of picking up your phone and playing the latest and greatest game, 
Pick up your phone and read your Bible from an app you've downloaded. Pray in those moments of waiting. Spend time in in devotion in those moments of waiting. Because as I see this unfold, as Peter concludes this letter, I see him really wanting, as as Craig mentioned this morning, wanting us to remember not only who we are, but who Christ is and what he did for us. Therefore, while we wait, can't I take that valuable time instead of playing Candy Crush? And he gives us three things to do in the beginning of chapter 3, starting in verse 17. He says, you there, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care, or some of your versions say, guard yourself. Guard yourself. While we wait, be on guard. You ever think about that idea of on guard? Go ahead and pull that picture up. This is a fencer. That's where the terminology on guard comes from when you think of a a sword fighter grabbing a sword and they say on guard. You know what they're meaning? It's a French word literally that means what? To get ready for or to, in fencing, take the fighting stance. What if we were to train ourselves while we wait to be on guard, to take care, to be ready to take the fighting stance because we all understand if you look back over the course of 2 Peter, we're fighting against all of these false teachers who are trying to give us falsehoods. Be on guard for those things. You know they're coming, so get ready. Take the fighting stance. Be on guard. What does he tell us then to be on guard for or to guard yourselves against? If we continue reading in verse 17, he says, Therefore, beloved, knowing that this beforehand, take care or be on guard first, that you're not carried away. That you're not carried away. How am I going to be carried away? Well, if I'm not on guard, it will be easy for me to not be carried away. Or to be carried away, rather. If I'm not ready, if I have not assumed the fighting stance, it's easy for me to be carried away. This idea of being carried away or carried away in the Greek is one word, and it's literally being carried away by influence. I was thinking of this moment, and and you can imagine Peter. Imagine Peter in a room. Maybe there's a candle on the desk while he's writing this letter. And the Holy Spirit has inspired him to tell them to be on guard so you're not carried away. I would imagine Peter at that moment had glimpses of his life. Because there's some interesting ideas that take place with this idea of being carried away. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 13, you know what the word there is used for when Barnabas was carried away by the hypocrisy of Peter? It's the same word. So when Peter withdrew from the Gentiles with the other Jews, what did it cause Barnabas to do? It caused Barnabas to be carried away. Are we ready are we be taking guard so we will not be taken, carried away or, be, or being taken away by other influence? And when I think of influences that, that have taken us and, and allowed us to think different ways, wouldn't Peter have a firsthand experiences with those influences? Remember Peter in the courtyard when he was surrounded by all the people who weren't the apostles and he was surrounded by all the people that wasn't Christ. And remember what he promised to not do is to deny Christ. And remember what he did? Why did he deny Christ? Because all of the influences around him told him, I can't be bold enough in this moment because I may be afraid. He says, be on guard while you wait. Be on guard so that you're not carried away by these influences. Guys, 
We live in a world where we have coined the phrase influencer. These are people who have social media accounts, YouTubers, who have made a profession in influencing people. That's what they do for a living. Will you be influenced and carried away by the world or will you be influenced by Christ and not carried away because you have taken guard? You are ready. And I know that when something comes into my life that is not truth, I will not be carried away. But he doesn't say just be on guard so you're not carried away, but he also tells us what? Be on guard so that you do not lose your own stability. Hmm. Interesting. Stability is an interesting word here. It's also the idea of steadfastness. And if you go back to chapter one, remember one of those virtues, those qualities that he tells us to strengthen our faith with was what? Steadfastness. He says, be on guard so you do not lose your own steadfastness or so you do not lose your own strength. Once again, as Peter's writing this, and Jed and I talked this week about, remember those sitcoms that had clips, episodes? They were like an episode where they would always start sitting around a table and they would start with things like, remember when? And then a little vision bubble, it would go, and they would remember back on when it was happening. Am I alone here or am I just doing a bad job explaining that to you? I could think of like Saved by the Bell. They're in the max and they're all sitting around the table and they're like, remember when Zach did this? As Peter is writing this, I, I imagine Peter going, huh. yeah, I remember, I remember when I withdrew from the Gentiles and caused Barnabas to be carried away? Don't do that. But here, he says, guard yourself so you don't lose your own steadfastness or your own strength. As I think about what Christ told Peter in Luke 22, in verse 32. Open up your Bibles to Luke 22. Luke 22, in verse 32. He had just got done telling Peter that you will deny me. But look what Christ says in verse 32. He says, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. That word strengthen there is our same word that he uses back over here in 2 Peter. When he says literally, be on guard so you do not become weak. As Peter is writing this, could he hear Christ's voice? Remember? Remember sitting there and my Lord told me that I would deny him and I told him I wouldn't. I told him I was, I was strong. I told him I was steadfast. I told him I'd never do that. And remember in the courtyard when I did that? Peter says, don't, don't be off guard, be caught off guard, be on guard. So when you're in the courtyard, you are steadfast, be on guard. So when these false teachers come, you know the truth, be on guard. So when you lose a loved one, you don't give up on your faith. Be on guard and supplement your faith. So no matter what storm may come your way, you're strong. He says, be on guard. Do not lose your strength. Because as we all know, guys, we need our strength. It's tough out there. We leave this morning and you're going to go out those glass doors and it's tough. Satan wants you to fail at Christianity. And he's going to throw everything he can at you. Therefore, Peter says, be on guard. 
Be on guard so you do not get carried away. And be on guard so you do not lose your own steadfastness. He tells us to why you wait, be on guard. But as if we continue reading, he says, while you wait, grow. I want to emphasize this point over and over and over again. We need to be a congregation of growth mindseted people. We need to be a congregation who wants to grow. And we have a growth mindset, meaning not only do we want to grow in numbers, but we want to grow in strength. We want to grow in knowledge. We want to grow in what he says here, in the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he gives us two reasons or two things to grow like. But growing, church, listen to me, is essential. Growth is essential. And to borrow a line out of Michael Green's write-up on 2 Peter chapter 3, he said this. He likened growth and its essentiality to our spirituality to riding a bicycle. And he says this. He says growing is essential, just like moving forward is essential when you ride a bike. Have you ever tried to stay upright on a bicycle that's not moving? How hard is that? Unless you're one of those trick riders, which I don't think any of us are. Maybe you are. I'd like to see it. But what is the ability or what allows us to stay upright on a bicycle? Momentum that's carrying us forward. It's movement. And I think that's a great analogy because if we are stagnant in our spirituality and not growing, how well do you think we'll be able to stay upright? But a lot of us seem to be satisfied with it. Some of us may be satisfied with no growth. I like it how it is. But Peter says, while you wait, grow. He first says, grow in grace. That's an interesting idea of growing in grace. It's our same word, favor. Grow in favor of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in favor of him. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, referring to Jesus, he says, Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and man. To grow in favor with God. How do you think we grow in favor? Well, if you look at the context of 2 Peter, we grow in favor by what? Growing our faith. Supplementing our faith with all of these things so we can stand firm, so we can stand strong. So Christ looks down and says, yes, yes. They're not wavering. They're remaining steadfast. They're not being carried away. He says, grow in the grace. But he also says, grow in knowledge. Knowledge of what? Specifically, knowledge of Christ. You ever had those moments when you're studying and the light bulb comes on, you're like, wow, that is awesome. You ever had those aha moments that allow you while you study and you say, wow, that's incredible. And it, you know, it like it releases endorphins and you just want to study more. And I can apply this to my life. But when I think of growing in knowledge of Christ, knowledge of Christ should keep me going every day. The knowledge that he was human. The knowledge that he lived a perfect life. The knowledge of how he responded to hard questions. But more importantly, the knowledge that he willingly went to the cross for my sins. The knowledge that he was beaten and spit on and persecuted because he loves me. Guys, we need to know that. Now, understand what I'm saying. It just needs not to be some fun fact for us. We need to know it so much that we dedicate our life to him as our king. But I read, and in my knowledge, I grow. 
And I grow in a knowledge that becomes real for me. It's not just a book that I read, but it's facts that I read. And I read that he died. And I read that he was buried. I read that he was human. And he was buried in that tomb, but that couldn't keep him because I've grown in knowledge and I know that after three days he rose out of that grave. And that resurrection out of that grave saves my soul. And I know that. Do you know that? Do you know that Christ's death, burial, and resurrection saves your soul? Five of you do. Do you know that? Let's grow in that knowledge. Continually striving after knowing Christ. I want to know Christ and the power of his rising. I want to know him. Therefore, Peter says, while you wait, grow. You can't stay up on a bicycle that's not moving forward. And let us not be so ignorant to think that we cannot remain steadfast if we cease to grow. That we will not be able to move forward if we just stay in one place and become stagnant in our Christianity. While you wait, grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And finally, as he closes out the chapter, closes out the letter, he says, while you wait, glorify. This last verse, he says to him, be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Glorify. If you didn't notice our theme of songs this morning, I will glorify the King of Kings. Father, we love you. And we will glorify you. I want to read the, the words to a song that I grew up singing. I don't hear it sung very often anymore, but the words to me exemplify this doxology, this glorification of God. He says, you are exalted, Lord, above all else. We place you in the highest place above all else. Right now, where we stand and everywhere we go, we place you in the highest place so all the world will know. You are a mighty warrior dressed in the armor of light, crushing the deeds of darkness, you lead us on to the fight. And through the blood of Jesus, victorious, we stand. Glorify God. It shouldn't take us to get to the first day of the week before we glorify God. We're to glorify him tomorrow, tonight, and we're to glorify him in our words and in our actions. I want people through what they see in me to glorify God. Isn't that what Peter says back in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 12? Let your actions be seen so what? They glorify God because of it. While you wait, glorify God. Some of the other songs we sing to kind of have us understand this. In my life, we sang it this morning. In my life, Lord, be glorified. Do the people you work with glorify God because of how you act, because of how you talk all week? Do you realize to act that way is an extremely unselfish way to live? Because I want people, through how great and how things that I do are, to glorify God, not glorify Dustin. I want to get to a place in my life where somebody comes up to me after a lesson and says, I appreciate that lesson. That was a good lesson. I want you to glorify God because the lesson was good. When you see a parent raising a child and they're doing a great job, glorify God because of that. 
Make sure you tell the parent. It's a great thing to see. How do we glorify God in our everyday lives? When we seek the good of others, we glorify God. When we take care of our aged parents, we glorify God. When we love our neighbors as ourselves, we glorify God. When we teach our children about Christ, we glorify God. When we love one another and not fight and gossip and dispute, we glorify God. When we control our tongue, we glorify God. Church, glorification of God is way more than just a singing worship service on Sunday morning. Father, I adore you, and I place no one above you. How I love you. Praise the Lord. O oh, heavens, adore him. Praise him, angels, in the height. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. O oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. To God be the glory, great things he has done, and loved he the world that he gave us his son. While you wait, glorify God. I know the apps are fun. And I know, as I have on my phone, I have a little game section of my apps, and it's for those moments I'm waiting. I pick up Danica from school Monday through Friday, and I get there early so I can park close. And because I get there early, I have to wait. The first thing we all do, I'm not alone. We pick up our phones. How can you wait and guard yourself while you wait with that phone. How can you grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ with that phone? And how can you glorify God in those waiting moments with that phone? May I suggest three things. Instead of opening up that game, open up your Bible app and read it. While you wait, grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Read through the Gospels. Read the resurrection account. It's about to be Easter. A lot of people are thinking about that this time of year. Maybe put in your favorite Christian song and glorify God in that moment. Maybe it's this moment where you turn everything off and you guard yourself by going to him in prayer, asking for protection. While you wait, he says, as Peter closes this letter, while you wait, be on guard. While you wait, grow. And while you wait, glorify, both now and to eternity. I love Second Peter. I hope you've grown to love it over the course of these lessons. I hope you can look back on it. I hope you can reread it. I hope you reread it again and maybe gain more knowledge of it. But it's very real to me when you think about that last call to grow, to guard, and to glorify as we wait for the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I can't wait till he comes. One day he's coming. Meanwhile, I'll wait. Let's pray. God Almighty, you are so great. Father, we are so sorry that we lose sight of you sometimes. Father, we wait for you to come back. We wait for that eternal home of heaven. We wait. But Father, encourage us. Give us the strength that while we wait, we continue finding you. We continue seeking after you. Father, we continue being on guard because we know that Satan is real. Father, deliver us from temptation while we wait. Father, help us to wait in expectation, knowing you're coming. Father, please forgive us of our sins so when you come, we will be found pure and perfect and ready to receive our eternal home. Father, help us to look forward to it. We pray all these things through your son's name. Amen.
This morning, if you were here, and maybe you are in a place where your waiting is not what it should be, and maybe you're waiting for something you're not sure of, maybe there needs to be some surety in your life about the coming of our Lord and Savior. Maybe you're worried because right now as you wait, you also pray that he doesn't come back because you're not ready. If you're not ready, if you're not a child of God this morning, if you have not died of the sin in your life to rise up out of that watery grave of baptism, to walk in that new life waiting for him to come back and you're excited about it, now is the time to do so. Now is the time to get right. Why together we stand and while we sing.